playing with your food. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid stand mixer and attachments. Hello and welcome to the very last in the British Library 2020 food season, generously sponsored by KitchenAid and coming to you live wonderfully from the Hand and Flowers Tom Kerridge's restaurant and pub in Marlow. My name is Polly Russell, I'm a curator at the British Library and I'm the founder and the curator of the food season. And this year I have had the absolute delight of working with Angela Clutton as the guest director. When we thought about the food season, we wanted to make sure it was really eclectic, really engaging, and that it included some of the most interesting voices in food. And Tom is certainly one of those. So I am delighted that we are here coming to you live. Angela is chairing this event, and that is just perfect. Angela is the author of The Vinegar Cupboard. Uh, that was her first book, and it won an obscene number of prizes. I can't even list them. She's also a regular writer for Borough Market and many newspapers and magazines. She runs the cookbook club at Borough Market and a podcast series as well. She is incredibly knowledgeable about food and restaurants, and so she's the perfect host for this evening. Over to you, Angela. Thank you, Polly. Gorgeous, gorgeous introduction as ever. And yes, we are here in Marlow, a fabulous way to bring the British Library food season to a close and here with lovely Tom Garrett, the best person to be closing the food season with. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do a little introduction to Tom, but I think um, we're obviously going to talk through the session you know, pretty much about everything that you've done, but just to give you know, a little bit of the highlights here. So we are here at the Hands and Flowers, although we're actually in the shed, which is a private dining. Private dining space, Private dining yeah. space, Hands and Flowers down the road, the coach across the road. Opposite, yeah all over Marlowe. Um, before this, works for chef and restaurants right across Britain. Um, and I think I'm right in saying 2005, Open the Hands and Flowers. Yep. yep. The first only pub to win two Michelin stars. So far, so there'll far. be others, I'm sure. <laughs> there will be others. Uh, 2014, Open the Coach over the road. Second pub in Marlowe, which within its first year of trading, received three AA rosettes, was rated the third best pub in Britain by the Top 50 Gastro Pub Awards, and was awarded a Michelin star in 2017. Also in 2017, you opened the Butcher's Tap in Marlowe, which is a butcher's, I love this, I love that you have a butchery as well as having pubs and restaurants and the whole thing. I really want to talk about the butchery. Yeah. Um, then October 18, opened Caribou's Bar and Grill um, at the Corinthia in London, um, followed by the Bull and Bear and Stock Exchange in Manchester, which opened in November 19. Still going on Tom's biog. Uh, four of your own BBC TV series. As well. I know I'm looking at you like you're going to tell me it's wrong or something. No, I'm trying, four... <laughs> trying to work out. <laughs> four of your own TV series, uh, as well as being at the helm of BBC's Bake Off, Creme de la Creme, Food and Drink, also hosted Saturday Kitchen, uh, so many best selling books, proper pub food, Tom Carriage's best ever dishes, and one of the reasons, one of the fabulous reasons why we're here, this beauty of a book, which is out, I think, in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, middle of November. Middle of November. You can pre order it now, though. Pre-order it now. And actually, even more than it's time to being able to pre-order it, um, you gorgeously signed some of these for the British Library. Yes. So we, if you go onto uh, the tab um, and you'll be able to see where you can buy the book, and it won't just be able to buy the gorgeous book, um, it's also signed by Tom, which is brilliant. Um, and we're going to talk loads about the book um, and just massive congratulations on it. It is Thank you. just a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, Let's get stuck in. Um, we're going to do about 45 minutes of chat and then we're going to go to questions. So anyone watching, if you have a question, please do pop it in. If you scroll down your screen, you can write a question in. Tom has declared himself happy to answer questions on anything. Anything. No bother at all. I'm not very good at spelling, so don't like that. However, like after that, we're all right. We can talk okay. about whatever you like. All right, good stuff. Um, so please do write your questions in and we'll get to those a little bit later on. Um, it's October 2020. Tom Carriage is a fundamental British restaurant scene. It is would be wrong to go through the session and not talk about everything that's happening at the moment for the industry. Um, and we will certainly get to that. Um, and I think it's very important for us to talk about that. Of course. But let's have a moment of celebration first before we get to that, because it's 15 years of Hand and Flowers and the book coming out. So let's just talk about everything to kind of you know, get to this point. Why a pub? 
So I'd worked in, I, I mean, I've been a chef pretty much since the age of 18. I, 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 right. I, I just approach it. Okay, well, let's go back, let's go back, let's go back, back, back. Okay. Let's talk about your journey into food. Well, basically, between the ages of 16 and 18, I didn't do very much. I kind of like dosed it. My mum calls it kind of like my dos years. And it was kind of like, I I did little bits on television, like as a like as a child actor. It was something bizarre. I fell into it. It's basically how I've spent my whole life. I just say yes to stuff and things kind of happen. And yeah. I, I'm just, I just go, yeah, all right. And I, I did it, but it wasn't really the world for me. It's not, it's not what I thought I'd ever be doing. And it wasn't something that... Um, it wasn't a world that I was completely like sucked into. Like acting, a great actors, amazing, brilliant. However, they spend their day pretending to be somebody else, and I find that quite a, like I like being me. Uh -huh. yeah. So I was like, okay. And so I ended up needing money as an eighteen-year-old, um, and so I went into a, a kitchen, um, washing up, basically looking for um, work and. Pretty much the moment I walked through the door of a professional kitchen in a, a hotel back in Gloucestershire was, um, I, I fell in love with, it's not food. I haven't, I didn't fall into the industry because of food. I haven't got, you know, I didn't learn to make apple pie with my nan and all of those sort of things. It wasn't, yeah. it, it isn't that kind of love story of food. It was the industry that I right. fell in love with. It was the people. It was the kind of left field way of life, the 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 late nights, the early mornings, the, um, the, the, Kitchens are quite often full of, um, I, I mean, I best describe it as like a pirate ship. It's full of like... Uh, is that people. why you call people pirates? Exactly. Okay. So so, our, so the Hand of Flowers, I mean, it's very much, there's a big sign on the door, on the kitchen door that says, danger, do not enter, pirates with knives and fire. And it's pretty much standard the way it is. It was, yeah. um, we, we, it's always the beautiful thing about the hospitality scene is it attracts many people from it. It's completely eclectic and wonderfully embracing. It doesn't matter what race, religion, sexuality, country, uh, monetary background, education, it doesn't matter where you come from, it embraces everybody because you're in it for the sole reason that it's, it's led by people with passion that love doing what they do in an area that's got a vibrancy and a buzz and, a, and, a, and an atmosphere that is very different to any other way of life. And I love that. I love the fact that if you work in kitchens or you work um, front of house, that, that world, is very very different and you were always told when i was younger that you know if you work in hospitality law the social life's really bad and the hours are really long yeah. well okay so the hours are really long however the social life is not bad the social life is amazing it is just very different but you know all the best bars to go to you know the best clubs you know the best restaurants you get looked after and chefs in particular have this kind of like pirate ship mentality it's quite eclectic there's quite often some waifs and strays of society that end up in kitchens and and they're great to learn from to be around people and it's a hugely um wonderful cultural mix of um, backgrounds and also outlooks to life that is quite you know some people have have quite dodgy past some people in kitchens still have dodgy futures however they're amazing to spend yeah. time with and i love that about yeah. it i love that about the industry so can I just jump in there with something? Yeah. Though? Because for some people, there is an impression of the restaurant industry as being quite, maybe quite macho, quite aggressive in the kitchens. Um, and there's also a feeling, I think, that maybe that is changing and moving food. Do you think both yeah. those things are fair, that it maybe was quite like that? And that that's. I think it's changing. adrenaline fueled. Okay. And that's slightly, that's different. So okay. where, where you get, get on that um, that adrenaline push, and it, it's, it's, it's very hard work, um, but it's not work. If you enjoy it, if you enjoy the idea of what you're doing, if yeah. you enjoy being, I don't know, it's the same sort of thing as I imagine people that do in Ironman training and things that, that, that run a lot or do a lot of that, you know, you like the physical pain of getting to the end of yeah. something. Kitchens are very much like that. And actually, when you work in kitchens, it's not so much about the cooking. A lot of it is about the repetitive process, the sore feet and the bad back and the whatever else of doing something, that physicality and that mental strength of getting through it and you have those kind of adrenaline rushes twice a day you've got to be ready for lunch you've got to be ready for dinner you're under pressure and it's a fine line between um um i suppose aggression and nervousness and being ready for lunch mm -hmm. and actually going the other side of it mm -hmm. where it becomes very very uncomfortable mm -hmm. and it's horrible so it, it, it's that level of always pushing yourself that i fell mm -hmm. in love with and kitchens the hours are a lot less now. We, we, everybody works very hard to try and make sure that um, 
everybody has their days off, whether it's two, whether it's three days a week, whether it's um, longer hours, half shifts, whatever else. So they're, they're much more, um, kitchens are much more embracing of a, a new, a, I suppose, a new need and a new culture within kitchens to make it much more embracing for for just for future generations mm. for younger for younger chefs coming into kitchens they they're very much of an instagram age yeah. so you see so much that goes on everywhere else yeah. and it becomes much more about the experience of of being places eating places seeing things and to do that you need to create an environment that people enjoy being in yeah. so yeah kitchens have very much changed since the early 90s when i joined them to, to now yeah interesting so fine dining as you say was sort of where you sort of fell in love with the whole thing and so to go back to my, my first question which I'm very happy we backtracked on my first question why pub why the move from being in that fine dining world to having the hand and flowers at the pub because on my days off the places that I would always feel comfortable in places that I've always felt most comfortable in was the pub so it, it, you know as as a chef it was always to me you know as a young chef or then even as I got older being in a pub is something that is they're very embracing they 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 again it comes back like kitchens that it doesn't matter um where you're from pub is short for public house i mean it's a public house it's a al- it's allowed everybody yeah. in you know when you work in top end restaurants or amazing hotels there is a certain pinch point of uh, demographic that will eat or dine or stay there and it might be somebody that has saved up money for for two years to come and have a wonderfully special occasion. However, they're not going to come back again mm-hmm. for n- another year or two. Mm-hmm. And if they do, if they save up that money again, they might choose to go to another top end yeah. space. The beautiful thing about a pub is it kind of embraces, it makes everybody yeah. feel comfortable. We all know from a certain age when you walk through the door of a pub, yeah. there's a pint of, you know, real ale, you go to the bar, someone should smile and say hello. And yeah. it doesn't matter whether it's the two missions or a hand of flowers whether it's a wet lead boozer just around the corner from the house, yep. there, there should be a warmth about it, an energy and an atmosphere. And that's why pubs are really special and are really special yep. to me because it doesn't matter where you're from, pubs should be embracing of everybody. Yeah. I think what you've really achieved in the book is conveying that. It's, Good. It really, really comes across because it is a fabulous recipe. You know, we'll talk about some of the recipes and they are staggering. But the initial build up to it when you really kind of set the scene for it all is just great because it sort of it really gets you as the reader into the world of the hand of flowers, that conviviality that obviously means so much to you really, really comes across. Um, and you do tell some lovely stories about the early days of hand and flowers. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, I mean, there's lots of stories. I mean, for 15 years, the hand has been there and we grew from myself and two other guys in the kitchen, Chris, who was one of the main um, is still with us. Has been we've worked together for nearly eighteen years now, and is the he, he's the person that really we owe a lot of this book to the process of putting it together. Right. And 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 Luke, who was the other chef in the kitchen when we first opened, who's now head chef at Glyn Purnell up in Birmingham. But we we opened that space, and and it was designed to be a place where food that we could enjoy and be we would like to be on our days off. And as it grows, and as the business has grown over the time and over these years. You know, the Kitchen Brigade now, you know, is, there's around about 18 chefs there over a seven day period rather than three. Mm. And, and through but the heart and soul, the DNA of the recipes and the ethos has, hasn't changed at yeah. all. Just the standard and the level of cookery has obviously grown and grown. And yeah. everything is about being always been about reinvestment within the business, but most importantly, people. So as it's grown and as people have come through the doors of the Hannah Flowers, there's also a lo- an awful lot of stories in 15 years time, 15 years of a business. You see a lot, you experience yeah. a lot, you go through recessions, we head to another one now, you yeah. go through people and staff and stores. Yeah. It's such a, 15 years is a long time yeah. in a business. And it doesn't come across like you felt it was a given when you started that this would all happen, that you would end up with other places and two mission stars for the hand of and all of that. It doesn't... No, I think if you open a business and you're, you you expect to just open and cook and get two mission stars, you, you, you're in the wrong mindset anyway. You know, when you go from being a head chef so then opening your own business in the first place, it suddenly becomes about survival. It doesn't come about what accolades I'm going yeah. to win or what I'm going to do. Yeah. It's actually about how do I yeah. stay open for the next week? Yeah. What do we do? How do we make money? What's our yeah. gross profit margin? Where are we reinvesting? What have we done? So at the end of year one, by the the fact that we were still there was fantastic. Because you, you talk about your wife, Beth, um, selling bread. It, yeah, so two thousand and eight was a very difficult period for us. So obviously the recession hit. We we're a young business with two and a half years old, three years old, heading towards, and 
we just bought a property um, for rooms. So the Hand of Flowers right. now has 15 rooms, but at that point we only had two. Um, and, and so we bought a property next door to convert. But as the recession hit, we were owners of a property that hadn't been converted, but the bank pulled the funding for it to be converted. So we're left with a property that we have no idea what to do with. So we have to make that harsh decision about whether we pay for the for the conversion of the property and we build it into the two rooms and try and generate revenue, which yeah. is what we did, yeah. which meant that we had to build relationships with suppliers and people throughout the whole of that recession, which meant that during that period, money was very, 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 very tight. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, we, we, to the point where me and Beth were taking no money out of the business, and the only way that we could survive, um, that I could see it was that we would do. We, I would try and bake bread. So on a on a Friday uh, Friday morning, we I would get up at six o'clock, head into the Hand of Flowers, and we would do. I would do a full be there from six six thirty, um, make bread, do whatever I was work the kitchen, move all the way through the kitchen, all the way lunch and dinner, and then at about eleven thirty midnight, once the kitchen was cleaned down, I would get a couple of Kenworth and the kitchen aid out and make bread throughout the night Friday night Beth would come in at around about seven o'clock Friday morning take the bread and sell it on a little stall into Marlow but obviously then it's seven o'clock in the morning Saturday morning so then I would just start through working the Saturday so we'd work all the way through to the Saturday so from Friday morning at six o'clock through to Saturday night at about midnight I would be at the hand of flowers doing like a 48 hour plus shift I mean I, yeah I mean but it is the kind of I at that period it was it was it's very very difficult the the pressures that the business is under are, are immense and huge and you have responsibility to staff and to people and to it, it's everything you've got every mm. single penny you've invested is there and mm. the only way that you're going to live is by fighting for it so now i reflect back on it and would be fully prepared to do exactly the same thing again now but when you speak to many other people that have businesses or run their own mm. business irrespective of whether it's in hospitality or whether it's it doesn't matter a building firm whether it's an accountancy whether it's whatever if you have your own business there are people that are doing 24-hour shifts trying to make their business work that at some point any business that stood a, a, a length of time say 15 years at some point somewhere the owners have had to do something yeah. that goes above and beyond what is deemed as normal yeah. into yeah. and so i love that period when i look back at it i love the fact that we did it we made it work we get through the other side and i know that we can do it all over again if we need to but it is one of those, you look at it and you think, yeah, I mean, it's, there have been some very difficult times during that period. And I suppose often those things are things that make something more special and mean so much because you've, especially when you're doing it with your wife, you're really kind of you know, getting through it yeah. together. Yeah. You had, but you already had one Michelin star at that point. We did, yes. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> so Michelin star not necessarily a golden ticket. To absolutely, you. Michelin stars are not golden ticket. Michelin stars are, are they're, they're, they're fantastic for, um, in terms of what they do is they help put a level of recognition for a guest and a consumer point of view that they go, okay, this this is a level that should be good. But then you have to match that standard mm -hmm. week in, week out, day mm -hmm. in, day out, service, each service, lunch and dinner. And that creates an added pressure. And Michelin stars don't mean you just charge loads of money. Michelin star restaurants are expensive because the ingredients are expensive and the staff that you are cooking it are professional. They're not, you know, they are they are people that use it as a, it's their career, it's yeah. their it's their life and their livelihood. So all of this is an added cost to your experience that you should get when you eat in the Michelin star restaurant. People should make you feel comfortable and have a lovely time. You should go away just going, that was really nice. Yeah. And, and that's the way that it should be. And that's, all those things cost money because they all have touch points with human beings. Yeah. Whether it's the, the ingredients that you're buying or purchasing, they will come from a person that has grown it or somebody that's looked after it. And, and will have a real um, a story, a conveyancy that comes all the way through from start to finish. And yeah. that's really important. And I think you touched on something which has really been a thread actually right through the food season and we're finishing up tonight and it's brilliant to hear you talk about that because it kind of brings together a lot of different threads we've had we're talking about food production systems and how separated we are really from where our food comes from and you talk a lot in the book I know and it obviously means so much to you outside of the book as well but generally in your work about well-sourced produce and as you absolutely beautifully said about people for whom this is a career and therefore need to be you know, paid properly and appropriately for that. And there's such an expectation, I feel in fear, about food being cheap. Yeah, I mean, 
the question that I get asked most, or not most, but the reflection you get on social media or whatever else is, wow, that's expensive. Why is that so expensive? Or why is that so? To be honest, if that's the question you're asking, you're asking the wrong one. Your question that you should be asking is, why is that so cheap? So when you're buying something from a supermarket, you should be going, why is that so cheap? Because if you knew the process of why that is so cheap, yeah. you would question why you, how or why you're buying it in the first place. If yeah. you understood the process of how you've got a chicken breast for 70p, at that point, you've got to ask about the chicken, the process, the understanding, the what, like all of those sort of things. That it's the wrong way to be looking at it. And, and that's very easy to say when you're in that, when we're in the food mm -hmm. world and mm -hmm. we understand it and you say it. And it can almost be seen as slightly um, snobbish. But it's, you, it's not food snobbery. It is an understanding of the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, where you go, we're not inflating prices just because. We, the price it is, is because we have an understanding of why, you know, the chicken, this chicken that we're using has lived a lot longer, mm -hmm. which means that it's had to be looked after a lot more. It's eaten a lot more feed and it's man hours mm -hmm. are a lot more, which hopefully conveys into a meal that, you, that tastes percentagely yeah. better. And... All of those sort of touch points are really, really important. Um, so, yeah, the question shouldn't be about why is it so expensive. The question should always be why is, why is that so cheap? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wish it were. But do you feel, Tom, that that attitude is shifting, that people are beginning to ask that slightly other question? I think people were beginning to start asking that. I think people were beginning to look at where food was coming from. Um, and have an understanding. I think at the beginning of the situation that we're all mm -hmm. in now, I think there was a process where people were cooking from home and they started enjoying ingredients and ordering mm -hmm. from um, people that couldn't go out to restaurants. We're looking at the suppliers that we were getting things from and, and supporting them, which is, you know, second tier in mm -hmm. a food chain that mm -hmm. is really important. Mm -hmm. um, but I do fear now that throughout the whole of lockdown, Plastics are an example, right? We were very worried about plastics. We were very worried about single-use plastic and what was going on. The moment lockdown hit, plastic came out the window. It just oh doesn't matter. It, 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 really, it really didn't matter. Whatever packaging was coming in for whatever you wanted, it plastic now. And I, I, however, we're now looking back mm -hmm. and going, okay, no, 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 we need to readjust again. You know, it's been six months. We, we're now looking at not plastics. We're looking at recyclable and, and cardboard and whatever else, however we're going to use it. But I also fear that now as we, we hit a point where people are, much more worried about money mm -hmm. at the beginning of lockdown there's a furlough scheme where people are being paid 80 percent and it's all working quite nicely and everything is coming under control and everyone isn't in fear of their livelihood mm -hmm. they go okay we're all in this together right now though where it's quite fractured and disjointed and people are quite concerned about their their futures or their livelihood or their families or whatever else i do think that a budgetary meals um, the cost of ingredients will start creeping back into people's psyche of, actually, I know that is more expensive because it's got mm -hmm. all of that, but maybe the ethics come out a little bit mm -hmm. because they're trying to protect the system and the money that they have. So I think it may we may take a step mm -hmm. backwards before we can move forward yeah, again. I think that's right. So I certainly felt at the beginning of the COVID situation in the spring that we had a moment where people were more interested than ever in where their food came from. But then, as you right, completely rightly say, other factors then sort of really kind of, you know, it's just not as simple. It's, it really isn't that easy and it really isn't that simple. And, we're, you know, it would be lovely if you just say, well, this is how to do it. Yeah. And everyone should just buy the best chicken. You know, yeah. you should just buy. However, what you what you should be doing, and I've never been one to say, everybody just buy organic free range mm -hmm. chickens. Mm -hmm. That is it. That have been, you know, that are a minimum of 18 weeks old and all that. Like for me, it's not. If you're, you know, if you're a single parent with two kids and you can only afford this chicken mm -hmm. that is the budget cheap one but you're still going to roast it and you're going to serve it with carrots mm -hmm. and you're going to do it with you know peas and you know you're going to serve a wholesome meal for me you go okay it's not about food snobbery mm -hmm. but it is about the cookery and it's about mm -hmm. the vitamins and the nutrition that you can get from it which is much better than necessarily getting a takeaway from a you know in a polystyrene box though so i wish it was as easy as to say this is what everybody should be doing yeah. everyone has their own situation yeah. of how to survive and how to provide a nutritious and balanced meal on a budget yeah. that suits them. Yeah, and the word survival obviously brings me back again to wanting to talk to you about the wider hospitality industry and restaurants and things, but let's let's jump back to the hand and flowers here for now, but we definitely will come back. Everyone's watching and thinking, why aren't they talking about restaurants and everything that's happening now? But we will, we will. Um, second Michelin star came. What for you, Tom, is the difference 
maybe for yourself, but maybe more broadly as well, between one star cooking and two star cooking? Um, to be honest, I, I don't really know. I, you, listen, I can't, no one can tell you exactly what it is to be, what it takes to win two mission stars. All I can tell you is about our journey and the way mm -hmm. that we have got to that level. And it was a point of, we achieved one star after 10 months of being open. And I, I've maintained, to be fair, I've maintained a mission star in a restaurant before for right. two guides. So when I, I, I sent my CV to mission with a covering letter and saying, this is where I am. And, this is, and they came and inspected and they inspected at least twice in that first year. Didn't the car inspectors, didn't the inspector's car break down? Yeah, the inspector, and it got broken into. Broken into. Yeah, it was parked in our car park. And we didn't, he hadn't, he hadn't announced and he left, but then he came back into the pub and said that his car had been broken into. And his laptop. So many great stories in this book. Uh, I know. <laughs> so Beth went out to see and look after the car and sweep up the glass from the car park, but then all over the back seat was his Michelin headed paper. <laughs> so then she was like, uh, and it was, it was like, and now you know who I am. And then it was like, I, so it was one of those when Beth comes in the kitchen and I, it's just like a hot, you, as a chef, you're going to melt down and go, yep. great, brilliant. So, but actually, that was a little bit of a blessing in disguise um, in a lot of ways because it meant that I was able to have a conversation with somebody. It wasn't necessarily as an inspector and a chef. It was about someone whose car has been broken into and the person who owns the car park that has happened. And then it allowed us to have a bit more of an open conversation around food and around restaurants and around the pub and where we want to be and what we're trying to achieve and what we're doing and what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And, and I did, you know, it wasn't a blatant, we want this, this and this and this and this. But it was a level of understanding of, consistency that I understood from them. I worked for Gary Rhodes um, before I'd opened the Hand of Flowers and um, the mission inspector cited Gary's food as being exceptional in terms of that Michelin starred level in terms of the number of components on a dish. You know, he was at, when we were at Gary, was at Gary's and you know, the way that Gary cooked was if there's three things on the plate and all three things are perfect, that's all they've got to judge on. And they go, Okay, three perfect things. But if you've got those three perfect things on a plate, but then you start adding a garnish of this and a bit of that and all of those sort of things. Now, all of a sudden, you've got three perfect things, but you might have two that are all right. And all of a sudden, that brings the dish down rather than elevates it because the inspector goes, those three things are great, but those two are rubbish. And you start going, okay, so this is a case of what we can take away and what process we can put in to ensure that the things that go onto the plate are right and correct. So then... From our point of view, my point of view, it was very much a case of standardizing, systemizing, making sure that things will always be the same every single time. And we go through that process and we achieved the star within the first year, which was amazing. But then everything we did was a reinvestment and a redrive of that process and a re-understanding of going, okay, this is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to make it. This is how we're going to simplify it. But how do we make it exceptional and stand out that suits me and my personality? And that question of where you get to a two-star level, I think, is always about consistency and it's always about the food on the plate. But I think at a two-star level, there is very much a level of understanding that you could tell. So there's 20, I don't know, 22, 25, two mission star restaurants up and down the country. Mm -hmm. And I think pretty much if you put 20 pictures, 25 pictures of each chef's food, you would be able to tell quite closely who chef, which is the chef that's cooked that food. Really? Without, yeah, I, you, you would be able to see a Sat Bain style dish, a Claude Bossy style dish, a Daniel Clifford dish, a Brett Graham dish, a Nathan Outwell dish, a Tom Kerridge dish, a Mark Birchall dish. You know, all of the, I think you'd be able to, from that point, all of a sudden then it becomes not just great mission starred cookery, it becomes great mission starred cookery with a personality that is focused on that chef. And I think that is where the difference becomes one and two. And then two to three, who knows? However, having eaten in three-star restaurants, there, there, is, there is a very, something very special about them that is just next level from everything. There's, a, there's kind of like a magic aura that sits around them. And there's many two-star restaurants that have that that are well on their way to that three-star accolade that probably already have it in everybody's heads. They just haven't got it in the book. And it's the same as many one-star restaurants that are at that two-star level that everybody is just, it's just a matter of time. You know, they are already two-star chefs even though they're cooking at one-star level. They will be, the cooking is two-star. They, they just will, they will get there. It's just that matter of time. So interesting. And it, I think that comes across in some of the recipes, well, all the recipes, because I, 
was reading it and loved all the stories and everything you kind of go really build up about the journey into it and then you get into the recipes and you go wow this is incredible food I didn't expect it to be incredible food but this is incredible and then you look at the recipes themselves and you're really helping people be able to deliver consistency in their own kitchen it feels yeah because you set it out so clearly yeah i mean i've got to be honest that's that's very helpful of the book designers as well bloomsbury and absolute have been fantastic in the way of trying to get this the recipes across in a level that is you know this is the eighth book that i've done and the, the ones before have all been for home cookery and the home cook and the understanding whereas this is the exact recipes that we follow at the hand of flowers that are done by professional chefs at two star level so there are so many components and elements that go into each dish, but being able to just circumnavigate the complete thing and just, uh, I suppose, uh, decompartmentalize each one and have an individual component is very important then for you to be able to, for, for the home cook to be able to make, I don't know, a beer cracker or the salmon mousse or a bit of venison chili that goes with something else. But also I think for the professional chef, where there's things that they've eaten or they see at the hand, that they go, that garnish would be really nice to go with. They might take a garnish that comes from a pigeon dish and go, actually, that would work really nicely with the venison. Nice. Or th okay. that they can take components of what we do and are able to put it into their own context and their own dishes. And that's very much how, I suppose, as chefs, we all work. There's no such thing as an original recipe. No one has come up with something brand new. Like, like it just doesn't exist. They are... They are um, movements and growth and understanding the where we are influenced by um, nature by method by technique and by other restaurants and other chefs where you go wow that's a really nice idea where you see somebody do something that you think well would it be really nice if you seasoned it with that or put it with that and change you know you change the concept or you move it around but all of those ideas they grow nothing nothing in here is original very generous Tom in acknowledging that because I'm not sure that everybody does acknowledge that quite so well and you certainly acknowledge it in the recipes some of the recipes you are gorgeous generous about saying you've been inspired by by someone or there's a chef within the team that really sort of you know, did a kind of a puree on a dish that really kind of set you off thinking okay that's we're going to create a dish kind of around that yeah and you're very um collegiate it feels in the way that you work with your teams but I think that, but that's the wholehearted honesty of it, the fact that the Hand of Flowers is quite a, a big machine of a lot of people, a lot of components of people that have been with us for decades, that have worked in the business for a long, long time, that have grown and adapted with it. It's not just me. There's a whole huge team of people there. And every single person is really, really important to the growth and the understanding of, you know, it, it says Tom Carey's Hand of Flowers cookbook on it. However, like the Hand of Flowers, the business is much bigger. It's not me it's a whole team of people that understands where we're going what we're doing and how we grow and it is really important that people get recognition for their input of what they do everybody that's come through the door there's chefs that have been at the hand of flowers that have lasted two hours but their input is still like they give us a story they give us something to laugh about they give us something they're all they're all points of they're all points that make the business grow and understand and give it vibrancy and give it life and that is really important the way that the dishes are com uh, i suppose compose and comprise and and the way that they built up are through stories information understanding and it could be from an 18 year old commie chef who walked through the door and go M -m my nan used to make the roasting mince method that we use at the hand of flowers first and foremost that has then transpired to all of the other cookery books is something that i learned from a half Italian 18 year old commie chef whose nan used to roast the mince for, for Italian style dishes in Italy Brilliant. when he came to the hand and did it for staff tea. And we went, that's amazing. What have you done there? I go, oh, I just really like roasted the mince until it was like, and you go, that's amazing. And then that drives flavor forward for everything else we do at the hand. But then, so that process is completely open to learning and people should, should rightly so get the recognition or the nod to inspiring. All right, the complete dish isn't necessarily them but that that thinking point that driving point that understanding of where we're going is very much a team effort yeah. it's collective i think there are actually seven pages of thanks at the back of the book and most of it's like you know thank you guinea pig and that's kind of it the publishers and stuff but you are really it, it, it feels if terrible sentence it feels very heartfelt and it is such a lovely thing to kind of read in a cookbook of this level with a chef of your level it's fantastic um 
Right, on spot, because the book is split into, um, so it started as Mates and Desserts. Yeah. If someone wanted to cook from this, the iconic hand and flour starter main dessert meal, which recipes would they go for? Um, starter and a dessert are really easy because they've kind of been on from the beginning and they kind of sum up, there's a lot of complexity that goes into the dishes now, the way that they've moved forward and the way that they've grown. But the smoked haddock omelette is something that's been on pretty much from the beginning and the creme brulee has been on from the beginning. So the, the, the lovely thing about those is when we were cooking them before even won a mission star means that the level that we were cooking at then is, is a two star for those dishes. Everything else, maybe everything else that was with it isn't. But at that point, those dishes were and they've grown and been with us for, an age, for ages, forever. And the smoked haddock omelette is a... It's a play on Omelette Arnold Bennett that comes from the Savoy. You know, it's not my dish. However, the, the way that we cook it, the thing, the, the level that we try, you know, it's four ingredients. It's really good eggs. It's amazing smoked haddock. It's fantastic. Parmesan we use as opposed to Gruyere. And I use Parmesan because it has a slight acidity and a really high salt content, which is really good, which counterbalances everything. It's understanding of levels of seasoning. And then a glaze that goes on the top that is made using um, kind of like a, a classic roux white sauce from the milk that you poach the haddock in. So it's all about driving flavor forward and a hollandaise. So that's the complex bit, but essentially it is eggs, cheese, smoked haddock, seasoning, glaze, that's it. And, and you go, okay, that's one dish. The dessert is creme brulee. So it, again, that is four ingredients and that is eggs, cream, vanilla, and sugar. And that, that really is, it's four ingredients, except it's the process and the way that we do it. And it's whole eggs, which is really important to me because that whole egg, this is, an, this is a play on an Elizabeth David recipe. So it's a classic, really old French studded, yeah. but it's whole eggs, vanilla, but you, have, you cook it to 82.8 degrees centigrade in a, in a thermomix or, or on the top of a stove. And you know, the fact that you can then suspend the vanilla as the eggs cook out is, is really important rather than it being vanilla cooked in a bain marie yeah. when it sinks to the bottom. Um, whole eggs are really important. Sugar content is quite low. Caramelized on the top really heavily to the point where when we first opened, we got a lot of complaints saying that my creme brulee is burnt. And we, I mean, brulee is burnt, mate. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The idea. The clues in the title. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and But that for me, it's really important because that kind of that bitterness really enhances the flavor of vanilla and eggs. Quite often, 15 years ago, when we first opened a creme brulee, something that was quite sweet and cloyey, yeah. and quite often you can still find it as a sweet cloyey pudding that everyone just assumes that should be what it's like. Actually here, you taste vanilla, you taste eggs, you taste caramelization, and that is really, really important to us. So those two, and then the main course, I mean, they're all quite complex and quite complicated, but one of the first dishes that we had on and um, does make an appearance backwards and forwards, we haven't had it on for a while, but it's the braised shin of beef. And in the book, it's stuffed into a bone marrow and wrapped in crepinette and done whatever. But when we first started off, it was the braised shin with a piece of roasted bone marrow, a dumpling and a carrot. And it is kind of essentially, it's the same sort of dish. It's a it's a deconstructed beef stew, basically. So the, the, the omelet, the shin of beef, creme brulee, yeah. and then definitely a snooze. I mean, you're definitely, <laughs> you're definitely a snooze. Brilliant. Um, do you want to talk to us about how you're handling things on your various places at the moment with the situation? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it it's it's a moving project. We have to become, as, as an industry, we're very, very good. And as an independent, you have a lot more um, flexibility to move, I suppose, with fluid times and we're, you're presented with lots of um, issues and complications and problems. Um, I think when we first went into lockdown, everyone just embraced it and this is it. And you, you were given this, um, you were given this blanket, uh, I suppose, 80% uh, pay for all staff that it was, for our point of view, as a team of people, irrespective of how much they earn, um, we still pay, we honored their salaries. So there's people in the, within the company that earn a lot more than £30,000 a year. We still honored their 80% because people have outgoings that are exactly the same, you know, 80% if you have a, a mortgage and kids and, uh, and you know, your, your weekly or monthly outgoings are still 80% of that. It doesn't matter if you're earning 30 grand or 100 grand, it's still, you know, you live your life to however much you earn. So we honored um, for that process, all the members of staff were there. Um, we, we weathered what we think was the first storm. You're then encouraged to kind of take loans and move to get a business reopen, which many small independents have had to borrow a lot of money for us to be able to reopen. Um, and open with 
a massive positivity for July the 4th, where um, particularly Marlo, the coach, and, and the Hand of Flowers has been very well supported. Great community, uh, wonderful space. Marlo is great. It's fantastic. Um, there are other issues within the London and the Manchester site in particular. They're both very, very difficult spaces. The London one is right in the heart of town, travel and tourism that's dead. You know, aviation is hit as hard as tourism, you know. Is it, is it open? It is open, yeah, we open okay. on July the 4th. And, and it's it, it's now beginning to struggle. The Eat Out to Help Out was very, very positive. You know, this is where everything becomes very confusing and becomes it, it becomes very frustrating where everyone is encouraged to go out and then now you're then you're closing everything off. And the good that was done. Seems... All the good that was done is, and now the problem is the tier two, tier three level. Irrespective, if you're sitting tier two or tier three, you as a restaurant you're still open. Um, however, you're being told yeah. you, your guests have to come from the same household, which means that you're not doing very much in the yeah. way of covers. So it all becomes very, very. It becomes a very, very difficult situation for us to deal with. Um, but because we are independent we can act and you move fluidly you try to react to situations quite quickly we have contingency plans we have ideas we we're quite lucky at the minute that at the moment we're in tier one when it comes to tier two we have to look at what happens with bookings and we have to be able to react accordingly so it, but it is it is a very very difficult time for the whole of hospitality and do you know what? even more so for wet lead pubs who are uh, places that we love dearly that should be supportive wholeheartedly however from from a government point of view you know there isn't a VAT reduction you know there was on restaurants and food but there isn't on alcohol so if you're a wet lead pub there is no support there and then the 10 p.m curfew it, suddenly those wet lead pubs are, are under an immense amount of pressure and those those places from you know, from us just looking at just on a on a daily basis, they're the sort of places that we all love going to. They're the places that people like to have a log fire and a pint of ale, or, or a, you know, sit there and have a cup of coffee and enjoy. But if those spaces aren't supported now, they're not going to be there the other side of it. So it, it's what time, a. What time would you be if you were sat here with Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak and whomever? What kind of support would you be wanting to kind of get in the rooms that we talked about? Financial support that is is huge in terms of it goes beyond staff wages so at the minute the furlough scheme ends in a couple of weeks time but then by the time it comes to a point where we're now going if you are forced closure it's 67 percent of staff wages well 67 percent of your staff wages is not a great deal it started off as 80 percent. that's fine 67 percent suddenly because if most people that work in pubs or a lot of people that are in restaurants or close to or near minimum wage, the moment that you take that down to two thirds of minimum wage, it suddenly becomes very difficult. Their phone bill isn't two thirds, their rent isn't two thirds, their car insurance isn't two thirds, their, you know, the, 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 their living ability suddenly becomes shrunk hugely. So there has to be much more to support these people. But then in terms of a business, if we work a business that operates at around about 30%, it's around about a wage bill. So even if you're supported to pay 67%, so that's 20% of your costs. So instead of it being 30%, it's 20%. There's still, of your 100% of costs going out, there's still 80% there. Even if you take, if you're in complete shutdown, 30% food and, uh, and, and alcohol is your cost. You're still left there with another 50% of fixed cost. Now a business cannot be shut still with those costs in place to then expect it to be reopened. So a huge, huge amount of financial packages need to be looked at for the hospitality sector to get to the other side. It's not just about paying staff 67% of their wage. There is a massive implication. And the problem also that we have is many small and young or operational businesses have borrowed money to get reopened, have streamlined, have worked efficiently to get to the point where you can be reopened where you can earn enough money to pay back the loans that you've just taken out, which are personal loans, they're not on business. So they're secured on personal. So now you find yourself in a position where you now have a personal loan and your business is in trouble and you've secured a personal loan to help the business survive. So there is a huge amount of pressure. And that's, I'm using us as an example, but that is 90% of the people that have reopened. And that's where the stress levels are now beginning to rise hugely. Yeah. Let's get to, some of the questions from people who are okay. watching us. Um, 
<laughs> okay. You said you'd answer anything, so we'll start, we'll okay. start with a fun <laughs> one. Um, what's the best thing about being a person who says yes to everything? And in what does it make, uh, and in what ways does it make life difficult as a chef and restaurateur? The best thing about saying yes to everything is that you do get to do loads of cool stuff that you wouldn't normally, like if you say yes to everything, I, I kind of, I try to get every meeting in. I never, no matter who it's with, no matter who I meet, no matter, because you never know it, who you'll meet after that or what it could lead to or mm -hmm. where it goes on to. And I, we've been so fortunate. We've done so many things. We cook at rugby stadiums, at football stadiums. We travel, traveled the world going to see all food related. You know, we've been... Hong Kong, Singapore, Monaco Grand Prix, cooking on yachts, doing whatever, showcasing British food in the States, in, in New York or San Francisco. You know, you just say yes to stuff and it's never about money. It's always about the experience. You'd always be about, they're all life enriching experiences, yeah. which are amazing. And the hardest thing about saying yes to stuff is, is actually trying to find the gap in the diary. Yeah. The problem then is becoming where it's just always trying to find the gap in the diary and then also protecting family life and yeah, trying to yeah, yeah. trying to put the juggling at the balance is, is that's the most difficult do you still work <clears throat> mega hours yeah I'm, i mean yes more it's not as there's no structure in my life so i used to have when i was running and as head chef and cooking at the hand of flowers every single day there was structure yeah. you would go in that's what i do that's where i'd be that's where it is now with, uh, I suppose, with multiple businesses and operational things in terms of like festivals that constantly get moved or things that, uh, you know, different restaurants and different issues that are happening in restaurants, books, photo shoots, interviews, television program, there is no days ever the same. So yes, I work immense amount of hours um, and sometimes it will be every day constantly. There is, every day there is always something. And that's the same as anybody who owns a business. You don't never have a day off, even if your business is closed on a weekend. You're still looking at emails and you're still worried about your business. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I am always, I'm always working with, and I find it sometimes I have to embrace it as exciting because I actually like structure and I like control. So I have to embrace no structure and I have to let other people that I trust have the control. So that's whether hard. It is really hard. I, do you know what makes it even hard? So I've just changed PA. So my PA was with me for nine, eight, nine years. She's just left to have a baby. Okay, so so I have a new PA who's been within the business for ages, but is now building that relationship of knowing that yeah, she's making the correct decisions about it. So letting go, I find the control of that. But I'm doing all right so far. <laughs> Very good. Um, someone's saying, uh, lovely questions coming in, Tom. Um, your passion and your love shine from you. But if you were not cooking, what else would you like to do or think you might have done? To be honest, so I grew up on an estate in Gloucester and I ended up, I fell into a kitchen. It was very, very lucky that the industry kind of found me and it wasn't about cooking. But if I wasn't, if I wasn't doing this, I would, honestly, on a, so my wife is an artist, she's a sculptor, and every now and then we have to take things around or can drive stuff around in a white van. And I, I absolutely, I would, honestly, white van, rolled up newspaper, <laughs> delivering stuff, man in a van. I would do it like I would, I would like it's, a, it's this, that sort of ma builder, something like that. That sort of job is where I'd be, I'd be most comfortable. I would, however, I think just because of the way that my brain works and the nature, I, just, I, I like trying to make things better every day. I would be like a furniture delivery man, but I'd just be really good at it. I would, I, would, I would make sure I am the best furniture <laughs> delivery man that there is. I think this leads on to another really good question. Um, what do you think uh, are the most important qualities for a trainee chef? Um, commitment and passion, and that's it. It, it really is that simple. Um, you should ne never, ever worry about job title, promotion, um, and you should never, ever worry about what food looks like because there's so many chefs that come through that are Instagram chefs, right? So they can stand in your kitchen and they'll do days with you and you take pictures of food and all the pictures look amazing and great. Pictures look amazing. However, if you're... I, the chefs that we always know that are going to be the best ones when they come for a day on a trial and they come to look and they, and they you know, we, we, to see if they, we're going to take them or they want to take the job. If they're the ones that are looking at the finished dish as it's being sent out, they're going, that looks amazing, that's incredible. You go, yep, yeah, okay. But if it's the one that looks at the raw ingredient, if the one that looks at the beef that when it comes in or looks at the artichokes or looks at the, you know, the strawberries or whatever else, and they go, wow, those strawberries are amazing. 
that's when you know, okay, this is somebody who's going to be good because they have an understanding of the raw ingredient, not the pretty picture at the end. Because that pretty picture means, actually it means nothing. It's only a pretty picture once, right? So if it, it comes down in front of the guest, the guest of it, everyone takes a picture of it, isn't that great? But by the moment they put it in their mouth, if it tastes rubbish, like then now the picture is ruined because they've taken a mouthful of it and they've got a whole dish of it not tasting brilliant. So it should always, always be about ingredients. So the best quality for a chef always is, is a passion, is an understanding, a willingness to learn, and, and, and want to know about the raw ingredient, not the pretty picture at the end. Yeah. And because Instagram has become such a big deal, it sounds like you feel that that has changed some aspects of how people come into the industry, what they want to do and change the, the focus. I yeah, and it's very important. It's an amazing tool. Instagram, I think, is fantastic. It's been brilliant for the industry and it is really good for conveying messages. It allows young chefs or anybody to be able to see different chefs around the world. You can see what Alex Atala is doing in Brazil. You see what Rene is doing over in Copenhagen. You can see what, you know, someone's doing up in Iceland or someone doing, you know, all the way around the other side of the world in Japan or Australia, you know, and you, you get, you can connect to a world neighborhood of chefs. And that is incredibly exciting and amazing. And it becomes about travel and experience and all of these things enrich from a chef's point of view, a chef's life, but it should still always be about ingredients which I think ties into something which is a, uh, we sort of touched on it earlier, but maybe you want to say a little bit more. Um, someone's asking, in the 15 years you've been working in the industry, well, 15 years a hand of flowers, but much more than that in the industry. Um, how have people's attitudes to food changed in the UK? Um, I would say people's attitudes haven't changed. There's, there's just been more people that have become interested in it. So the attitudes towards um, ingredient has grown. There's been, you know, you could cite lots of different reasons of why the food in this country has got much better. I, I mean, if you look at um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, if you go for food, a, a British pub is somewhere where, I mean, the food is rubbish. You're not, you know, it's, it, you're not expecting anything good. Now, any of us would expect to walk into a pub that's got, I don't know, a fire and ball painted door or whatever else. And you're expecting to go in there and have an all right meal. You're expecting to have a good fish cake or a, a, a lovely mackerel escabeche or a really good fish and chips or something. You're expecting at least a, you know, a semi good meal yeah. from a pub. 20 years ago, you weren't expecting that. And that's kind of grown because um, I think Rene uh, um, um, in Copenhagen over at Noma kind of, that idea of produce coming from within that sector and that area that suddenly became fashionable for chefs 10 years ago. All of what Rene was doing suddenly meant that in this country, in Great Britain, we started as chefs, professional chefs, started looking at going, hold on a minute, why are we cooking all these Mediterranean style flavors? Well, what are we doing? We're really good at curing and pickling. We're a Northern European country. Most of the time we wear a jumper. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, we've got great root vegetables. We're very good at smoking things. We're ready with that, that preserving process. Actually, we should be embracing this. Our potatoes, our carrots, our swedes, our parsnips, our, you know, Brussels sprouts, all the things that actually before we were slightly embarrassed about is now actually, no, no, this is really, really good. And also we have four pretty definitive seasons that is to change that are exciting. So that British food scene suddenly started becoming very, um, proud of the food that it was serving. Gary Rhodes, for example, winning Michelin stars doing steamed suet pudding. Amazing. You know, all of a sudden you're going, no, 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 we should be proud of what we're doing. So that food scene has developed and grown. And then from a consumer point of view, programs like Great British Bake Off, I think has been phenomenal for the food scene because it, what it has done is it showcased that kind of post-war style cookery, baking, curing, making your own cider or doing your own, you know, all of that home growing, that understanding of where produce comes from or having a go yourself has been really good at that. People, there's more people baking that. I mean, there's so many people making cupcakes, you wouldn't believe, but that's, but that is amazing. It yeah. means that people are doing stuff. And I think, um, so I think the interest in the food scene has absolutely massively grown and it's allowed us to become more um, proud of our own ingredients that there was a certain number of chefs that we were already very proud of what we do, but I think it spread it to the wider public. That just a, just a slight switch in mindset that has then led us to being one of the most exciting food scenes in the world. Oh, that's really right. So often you hear people say, you know, 
the UK doesn't really have a, a food heritage you know, to, to be proud of in the way that someone like you know, France or Italy you know, would. And I always feel that's so wrong that you know, we, we, we just got it really wrong for certain periods of time. But if you go back and back, you know, we have wonderful food heritage. We're saying the produce and really respecting the seasons and the provenance of everything is we do, there. But also, this puts us in an incredibly strong position. If you think of French cookery and if you think of Italian cookery and you think of Spanish cookery, you will, you will think of the dishes of, of paella. You'll think of you'll think of cockavan. Uh, you'll think of pasta and pizza, and you go right. Okay, that's that style of cookery. In Great Britain, we are a hugely cultural and exciting mix. You know, one of the best dishes or one of the most known dishes, you know, is chicken tikka masala, and you start going. All of a sudden now, we have so many things to draw on. We are incredibly diverse, culturally rich. We have a wonderful food scene that we're third, fourth, fifth generation, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Jamaican, that there is so much of a food scene that we can all draw upon that is British. It puts us in a position where we, we can do pretty much anything and be anywhere that we want to be within the world because that is still then British cookery. And that that for me is incredibly exciting. It re uh, like it really is. All right, so maybe some of the ingredients we don't grow here. We can't get kaffir limes here, or we can't get turmeric, or we don't get. But however, the fact that that ingredient can be part of British cookery leads us with this fantastic foundation for us to flourish and grow. Yeah, brilliant. Um, are there any hands of flowers recipes which were just too complicated to include in the book? Um, no, no, there are. The, the book is. We break it all down, and if you were to look at it, if you were just like going to have a go at one of the dishes on Tuesday night, you're in a whole world of trouble. I've got to be honest with you. You think you're going to do everything? You know, you've got to remember that we've got like 18 chefs up there. There's at least 12 on every day that we are making, and and it, they are two or three day processes. The chocolate cake, for example, um, it, it is almost a three day process from start finish, freeze, but spray with chocolate. Do it. You're not just going to go. I'll make the hand flies chocolate cake tonight. You know, and it's. It, it, they are processes. So we weren't, not one bit of it have we been frightened of. This is the honest, true reflection of what the hand of flowers is. But you can break that down. So the hand of flowers, chocolate cake, the tort bit, the moussey bit, you can make. So that's absolutely fine. It's just the whole process of putting it together. So no, we've, it's, it's, it's everything that the book is about the hand of flowers and the way that the dishes have grown and evolved over 15 years. There's some dishes in there that very much on a one star level that they were, that I needed them and wanted them in the book because they they help reflect that journey of where it goes to to get moving forward, and that's really important. So there are less complicated ones in there, but there are some in there that are like, yeah, yeah, you, I mean, you're going to be brave going for this. Yeah, but I think it's wonderful that you're offering offering people the opportunity to really kind of get stuck in and go for it themselves. We've just said before it's really broken down so well, and if you want to commit a lot of time in the kitchen and do something which is going to be completely immersive. This is absolutely the book to go 100%. for. Hundred percent. You might need to invest in a bit of kit as well. You know, things like a pack of jet and a water bath and a sous vide machine and a rationale oven and a, and a, and the list might go on and on and on. However, you know, if you if you're feeling flush this Christmas and want to treat yourself, there's plenty of stuff you can get. Yeah, and also you can just read it and go, oh wow, wow, yeah. wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. Or just read it, love it, and make a book in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. See, see what you did there. Uh, one more. We're nearly out of time. We're just going to um, try and go for one, maybe two more questions. Um, Tom, do you think becoming a chef is still one of the professions where you are judged purely on talent and hard work rather than who you know or what background you have? Do you, and if you do think it's the case, do you think, do you see that continuing? Yeah, I, I, being a chef is very much, I think, like being a professional sportsman. That the, the, the age, you know, it's quite a young person's kind of industry that you get in. As you, as you get older, you, you get closer to being, um, you know, more management style, you know, you have to get an understanding of what happened. You're, the guys that are cooking the meat and fish, they're playing the game. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter who you know or how you get the job or what you do. It's how you perform within that space. And the better that you are at doing it, the more understanding you have, the much easier it is for you to progress throughout the industry. It's very much the most beautiful and eclectic, um, diverse and brilliant industry. But it's very much a case of, if you are 
good at it, you excel at it, you will do very well at it, irrespective of whether you can read or write, whether you've got loads of money and whether it doesn't matter what country you've come from, you've ended up cooking here and you're a part of it, you can 100% excel because it's the most embracing and eclectic industry to be in. I know you've used the word embracing a couple of times and I think it's just a, a wonderful reflection, I suppose, upon the industry that you really feel that. And I, it, it, as it comes across in the book, but it certainly comes across with you. Um, so the book's out 12th of November? Yeah, I think uh, 11th. I 11th think. of 11th, November. 11th, but you can pre-order now. You can pre-order now, and not only can you pre-order, but you can uh, get a signed one from Tom if you go on the British uh, Library tab and order it. Um, a complete joy of a book and a complete joy to talk with you. And um, what a way to, uh, to round off the British Library food season. Thank you so much. Thank Tom. you very much, mate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom and Angela. I feel totally enthused. What an amazing way to end the 2020 food season. What an honour to have Tom Kerridge see us out. That is just fantastic. I have to say that we weren't entirely certain that the 2020 food season would take place because of COVID and everything that's gone on this year. We are delighted that it did. We managed to do 15, I think 16 events. We've We've covered cookery books, sustainable food, black British food, Jewish cookery, restaurants. We've done feeding children, food banks. We have covered a huge amount of topics with an amazing cast of contributors. It's been absolutely wonderful. We are looking forward to doing the food season in 2021. We hope we will be able to do it in person at the British Library. I know Andrew and I would love that. We would like to say very big thank you to our sponsors, KitchenAid, Thank you so much to everyone who's contributed to this wonderful season and thank you to you for being a wonderful audience.